Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, we'll get started. My name is Paul Salem, president of the Middle East Institute, uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all uh, to this evening's event, done in co coordination with CARE uh, and with Beth Solomon, who's the managing director of CARE. And Beth, thank you for being with us today. Uh, let me also start by saying uh, Shana Tova, uh, happy Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I learned that it's the year 5,775 in the Jewish calendar. And as somebody famous once said, uh, somebody famously once said, things in the Middle East have been tense and unstable for a few thousand years. It can't go on much longer, so there is hope that it should come to an end. Uh, MEI has been around for 73 years, so not, not that long, but uh, uh, we're very thrilled that you're with us here in our brand new building, which we moved into a year ago, a month ago, sorry. Yeah. It features an art gallery that you see when you first walk in. We currently have a show of contemporary Arab art. The next show is, will be a show of contemporary Kurdish art, followed by Palestinian art, followed by Middle East art, and many other shows that are that are in the world. Uh, obviously, the Middle East has gone through one of the most turbulent periods uh, of, its, uh, of its recent history, which has created a lot of human insecurity and human suffering. And it's fitting that we be here, a combination of care, which cares and has done since World War II for the human security aspect, the human suffering, and attending to that. Uh, and a think tank as well as uh, policy experts who've worked on some of the political defense and negotiation aspects of developments uh, in the Middle East. We're very thrilled to have with us uh, uh, Mr. Bill Burns, currently president of Carnegie, Ms. Michelle Flournoy, and Secretary Ernest uh, Moniz, who we will introduce a bit later, as well as Michelle Kozinski, who will moderate the first session. So again, uh, on behalf of the board and staff of MEI, welcome. And Beth, thanks for uh, partnering uh, with us on this event, and uh, a few words from you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm Beth Solomon of CARE here in Washington, DC. And I'd just like to say thank you so much to Paul and the Middle East Institute. We have a program called the CARE Global Leaders Network. And it's an active community of business leaders, national security leaders, and diplomatic leaders who understand that humanitarian and development aid are essential to global stability and even our US national security. So we're just thrilled to be able to be here uh, with, with people who are interested in these issues and come to this, the Middle East Institute, as a resource for forward thinking uh, and moving our world toward a more peaceful and prosperous place for all. So thank you, Paul, so much. Thank you for having us. There's more information about the Global Leaders Network on the registration table. So thank you. Thank you, Beth. And uh, let's get started with the first uh, session. Uh, we're going to start off tonight's event with Ambassador Bill Burns, uh, who is here along with Michelle Kaczynski. Ambassador Burns, as uh, most of you know, is currently the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace up the street. He was U.S. Deputy Secretary of State from 2011 to 2014. Before that, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Ambassador of the U.S. Uh, to Russia. Uh, obviously, has uh, deep experience in the Middle East. Was a lead negotiator uh, with uh, the Iranians on what uh, what ended up as the JCPOA was also ambassador uh, to Jordan, knows the Middle East extremely well, and cares a lot about it. His uh, book recently out called The Back Channel, a memoir of American diplomacy in the case for uh, its re renewal, uh, is a must read. Uh, and I encourage those who haven't read it yet to buy it after the event and read it. Uh, a, a, a wonderful and, and fascinating account of a wonderful and fascinating and very impactful uh, career. Uh, so thanks for being with us uh, here um, today, Bill. Uh, and we also welcome uh, Michelle Kosinski, who is an Emmy Award-winning reporter and senior diplomatic correspondent uh, for CNN. Uh, Michelle covered a wide range of domestic and international stories for the network, including the earthquake in Haiti, the aftermath of the Arab Spring, the military handover in Afghanistan, terrorist plots and bombings in Europe, and many other developments internationally, as well as domestic developments such as the Virginia 
tech shootings, uh, the aftermath of the Hurricane Katrina, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. She received her Emmy Award for live reporting during NBC's special coverage of the 2008 uh, presidential election. Uh, uh, Michelle and Bill will have a, a conversation and then we'll be integrating questions from you. Uh, in order to facilitate that, we will be using uh, technology. Uh, and on the screen, you will see a website which is menti.com, uh, www.menti.com. If you get on there and enter the code 867691, you will be in this session. Uh, and you can submit, this is on your phone, uh, submit questions. Uh, they will go directly to Michelle, who can view them and then integrate them into the conversation. You can put your name to the question. You can have it without your name. Uh, it's all, it's all uh, good. That way we can get as many of your questions in uh, in the tight space of time we have for this evening. So Michelle and Bill, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And join me in welcoming them. Yeah, I, I eagerly await your questions, and as I'm sure Bill does too. And as you've heard, of course, Ambassador Burns has done everything in his career. You, you have seen a lot of change, but I think that we would be remiss to not start out with asking some about something that's going on as we speak. Uh, the State Department retroactively classif classifying emails from diplomats, including your own, um, in an investigation still of Hillary Clinton's emails. Um, just give us your thoughts on that. And have you seen anything like this before? No, I mean, there's a lot that's unique, I think, in some ways about the current administration. And I think this probably qualifies as well. I mean, I, you know, it is, it is a strange process to go back and retroactively classify things as well. Um, I certainly don't fault the people that are going through this in parts of the State Department and trying to deal with a backlog. Um, but, you know, it's part of a bigger concern about, you know, what's happening to my old institution today in the State Department, which is really, as I try to write about in the book, the hollowing out of American diplomacy at precisely the moment when I'm convinced, at least, it matters more than ever. You know, when we're no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. Um, when we still have a strong hand to play compared to our major rivals, but where diplomacy matters to help us invest in alliances and mobilize coalitions of countries, which really is what, it's the capacity which sets us apart from lonelier powers like China and Russia. And so I worry that in a variety of ways, we're squandering that asset today as well. Yeah, so we see <coughs> class, new classification of diplomats' emails. We see the leaking of people's diplomatic cables. We see political vetting now, which has been proven inside the State Department. We see proposed enormous cuts to the State Department and proposed enormous cuts to aid for development in other countries. Do you feel like the tools of diplomacy and the methods of diplomacy that you had cultivated your entire career are now under assault around the world? Yeah, I mean, certainly in the United States, I think we're doing a lot of damage to ourselves. I mean, you're never gonna get very far in diplomacy unless it's backed up by military leverage and economic leverage. So there's always gonna be a disparity in budgets. But you know, the most recent budget submitted by this White House was for $750 billion, if I recall, for the Pentagon and $40 billion for both diplomacy and development. 19 times uh, higher for the Pentagon. And it just strikes me that, you know, there's an imbalance there that we don't address. But even more than the, the budgetary challenge is the fact, again, on the theme of hollowing out, you know, there's been over the course of the last three years or so a 40% drop in the number of people applying to join yes. the Foreign Service. You have a record number of senior vacancies, you know, not only chief of mission jobs overseas in the Middle East and elsewhere, but also in Washington. You have the particularly pernicious practice, in my view, of going after people who worked in the last administration on controversial issues, career people. Absolutely. And that's, yes. you know, that's how you hollow out an institution. And those are the sort of tangible factors. The intangible is the kind of dismissiveness toward diplomacy that you often uh, hear from President Trump. You know, when he was asked a little more than a year ago about 
whether he was concerned about all those senior vacancies in the State Department here and overseas. He said, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. You know, that's diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism. That's not the diplomacy that I learned you know, years ago as a young diplomat working for Secretary Baker in the State Department. Yeah, and you, you <clears throat> go through these riveting stories from your career. If, has any, who, who has read the book? Has anyone already read the book? If you haven't, <coughs> I would highly, it, it's such a great read and it gives you the inside look at, at some of these pivotal moments in history. And you begin with a time when you say American, when American power and diplomacy were at their peak. So describe that moment um, and what that felt like in contrast to what you just described as going on today. Well, I mean, I think in many ways this was, you know, in the period I, I worked as a pretty junior diplomat in the George H.W. Bush administration. So in my experience anyway, it was an intersection of a moment when American influence in the world with the end of the Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union was at its zenith, at its peak. But that was coupled with a second reality, and that is there were a group of senior American statesmen in President Bush 41 himself, in Baker as the Secretary of State, Brent Scowcroft as the National Security Advisor, Colin Powell was then the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who you know worked, I thought, particularly skillfully together. And who had a sense of strategic purpose. They knew this moment wasn't gonna last forever, the unipolar American moment. <laughs> They had a sense of strategic empathy, which isn't the same as sympathy. But for example, President Bush and Baker and Scowcroft understood what Mikhail Gorbachev was going through, you know, at the end of the Cold War as his own state was collapsing around him. So you didn't see them dancing on the Berlin Wall then. And a sense of strategic discipline as well about how they balanced ends and means. Um, and that I learned a lot in that, in that period. Yeah, and, and during that time, the end of the Cold War, you see regions of the world fighting against authoritarianism and, and trying at least to embrace democracy. And now you see what have been during periods of time reliable democracies and good allies for the U.S. making a shift towards authoritarianism. Why do you think that is? Well, part of it is, I mean, I remember very well in 1989, you know, the feeling that was the, the peak of globalization euphoria. I mean, the sense right. that a lot of us shared, I think, um, maybe naively, that, you know, it was a question of when, not if, that open political and economic systems were going to take root around the world. And of course, the reality always is that systems of governance that don't deliver for people, you know, ultimately become dysfunctional. And I think you know, I was in London a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it drove home to me the fact that we're having political nervous breakdowns on both sides of the oh, Atlantic everywhere. right now. <laughs> and so I think a part of the problem is us in democratic systems not mm -hmm. delivering for people and maybe getting a little bit complacent. And so we need to recapture that habit of good governance of being able to deliver. Because I don't think authoritarian systems are 10 feet tall. Many of them are far less adept at actually, over the long term, delivering for people. Sure, and have to rely on force to make up for the insecurity or mm -hmm. the weakness underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the recurring themes in the book is the wheels of diplomacy trying to make the choice between acting quickly, striking while the iron is hot, so to speak, and having patience and, mm -hmm. and waiting to see how things play out, or as you put it, managing problems versus trying to solve them right now. And, I, and you describe some of the, the failings that you saw in American diplomacy happening because the wrong choice was made along that spectrum. Do you think that that's always going to be the biggest challenge of diplomacy is acting versus not acting? and there's yes. so many factors at play. When, as, as you know, Michelle, from covering the State Department, I mean, you know, there's always an impulse, especially in American political culture, to do something. And sometimes the hardest thing is to restrain yourself a little bit, too. There's got to be a balance, certainly between ends and means, but also seeing moments when you need to take risks, you need to act boldly. I mean, again, going back to the Bush 41 administration, you know, in hindsight, German reunification looks like it was easy or foreordained. Um, that was not such a certainty at the time, but it took a willingness on their part and the part of a lot of European statesmen um, to take advantage of that moment. And yet at other times, 
when, for example, after Desert Storm and the expulsion of Iraqi forces from Kuwait in the spring of 1991, as a purely military matter, it would have been the easiest thing in the world to keep right on going to Baghdad. Right. But there was a sense of discipline, a recognition right. that you know, that would have caused the coalition that they had worked so hard to put together to begin to crumble. And a lesson that we should have paid attention to a decade later, you would have then owned the aftermath of, you know, Saddam Hussein's toppling as well. Right. And I think that's one of the most painful things to read in your book is your description of trying to make the case against the invasion of Iraq and then struggling with later, did you do enough? Um, do you think that the U.S. has learned the lessons from Iraq? Because over the past decade, we have seen restraint and war weariness, but we've also in some instances seen hawkishness that doesn't necessarily lead to action, but very well could, and that, that frightens many people now. Oh, what do you think about the lessons that were learned or not learned? Well, I mean, I think the experience in Iraq in 2003, and I tried to be honest in the book about all the things I got wrong, because there were lots. And, you know, even though many of my colleagues, some of whom are in this room, who served with me in the Near East Bureau and the State Department at that time, shared deep misgivings about where we were headed. You know, in my case, at least, I got it about half right about, you know, what could go wrong after the end of the war. I remember the most depressing brainstorming session of my three and a half decades as a diplomat was one afternoon in the summer of 2002 with two of my colleagues, Ryan Crocker and uh, David Pierce. And we set out to lay out all the things we thought could go wrong after the toppling of Saddam Hussein. And we called the memo the perfect storm. And rereading it you know, years later, we got it about half right. We got a lot of things wrong too. But it was an honest effort, at least, to lay out our concerns. And so the lesson, I think, as a professional diplomat or a career public servant is that, you know, I have huge respect for people who chose to resign from government because they couldn't in good conscience carry right, out. Right. On the other hand, it's honorable to stay within government, um, but you have an obligation um, to be honest about your concerns then, too, even if it's inconvenient. And you know any institution that doesn't encourage that um, generally becomes a lot more brittle over yeah. time. And I think in, in <clears throat> your, your work, you've really been blunt about mistakes you felt you made mm -hmm. or that the US had made, as well as the victories and where you mm -hmm. really felt, felt like it was functioning fully on all cylinders. And I think, speaking of which, I think I've pressed a wrong button to get the um, audience's questions, because I would love to hear some of your questions. Soon you will tire huh. of hearing me ask my huh. million questions, I'm sure. So I eagerly await yours once we get that <laughs> up and running. Um, but during your time in Jordan, mm -hmm. you described in your book warning the Clinton administration that the US was acting passively, reactively, and defensively in the region and needed to regain initiative. Um, how does that compare with the U.S.'s role today, would you say? Well, listen, I'd be the last person to suggest in all of the years I was connected to American policy in the Middle East, either in Washington or overseas, that we had a pristine record. So, I mean, you know, we got a lot of things wrong over the years. I think the danger today, as you look at this administration's policy, is that, you know, it, it tends to be so... Um, you know, transfixed by the challenge of Iran. Now, I don't need anybody to convince me about the ways in which this Iranian regime can threaten our interests and the interests of our friends and partners in the region. But as you well know, it's a region that's got a lot of complex challenges. And so you've got to be able to look at all of them, not try to shoehorn everything through one particular prism. Because the danger then is that you end up, much as we ought to push back against you know, um, a threatening or aggressive Iranian behavior, you know, you also need to be careful not to be indulgent of authoritarian partners in ways which aren't going to serve their long-term interests either. When they overreach either externally, as I think the Saudi leadership is today in Yemen, which is a both humanitarian and strategic catastrophe, or overreach internally, as in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in a Saudi diplomatic facility in Istanbul. So, and, you, and you've got to pay attention not only to other challenges to regional order, unresolved regional conflicts like the Palestinian issue, which hasn't gone away, and you've got to pay attention to the 
deeper drivers of dysfunction and change in the region, you know, which we saw erupt in the Arab Spring or the Arab revolts. And you know, they may be more dormant today in some societies, but they haven't gone away. And friends of ours and adversaries of ours that don't pay attention to those deeper drivers of dysfunction mm. you know, are going to become more brittle also over yeah, time. Yeah, you really <laughs> lay out the, the highs and lows of, of trying to work out this seemingly intractable problem of Middle East peace. So now in this administration, you see this unique attempt where they've tried to put out economic incentives first or an economic plan first. They're no longer talking about two-state solutions. They, re they refuse to say that phrase. <coughs> um, and we have yet to see what the, I mean, elements have leaked out of what the peace plan will be, but they insist that's not it or they, they won't talk about it. So right. <laughs> what, what hopefulness or not do you have in this somewhat novel approach to solving this? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not opposed to novel approaches right. or thinking outside the box. I've just always thought it helps to know where the box is before you start thinking <laughs> outside it. And I, what I'm afraid of is that from what I read of the deal of the century, that it's based on a series of false assumptions. The false assumption first, that you can essentially deal over or around the Palestinian leadership. Um, second, the false assumption that you can substitute economic possibility for political dignity. If the Israeli, if the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict were just a matter of dollars and cents, it had been solved a long time ago. The false assumption that somehow time is on our side. Because the reality, as friends of Israel, which we are in this country, um, the reality is that if you play this out over the next decade or so, Arabs are gonna be in the majority in the land that Israel controls from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. So the question purely from the point of view of Israel's long-term health and security is how do you sustain you know, a Jewish democratic state in that kind of a circumstance? And what I worry about is a last false assumption that there's no collateral damage in all this. And I worry, for example, about Jordan, a place I served right. 20 years ago as ambassador. What's going to happen if a two-state solution literally does expire, you will see people on the right in Israel resurrect the idea of exporting the problem across the Jordan River. And that's a huge challenge to the stability of a relatively small, modestly endowed country that matters, you know, from the point of view of the United States and stability in that part of the world. As expected, um, you all have great questions. So here's one provocative one for you. Should the, the next administration whichever that will be, seek to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal, or should it press for an entirely new agreement? Well, I'm a recovering diplomat, so you know yeah. my, my answer is um, yes and. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, partly it depends on where we are if there's a new administration in January 2021. In other words, is there something you can go back into? If there is, my honest answer is I think, yes, you'd want to try to, rejoin, resume compliance with the agreement, but you'd have to simultaneously start a serious mm. set of talks and negotiations mm. about dealing with issues like timelines, you know, ballistic missile development and other issues. Even going back to the secret talks with the Iranians in 2013, we were always very honest in saying that the agreements we eventually reached, the interim agreement at the end of 13 and the comprehensive nuclear agreement, were meant to be the beginning of diplomacy, not the end of it. Sure. Like any arms control right. process, you build on the foundation of one agreement and deal with you know, the remaining concerns and challenges that we and lots of our friends face. So that's, you know, um, all of us are so much smarter after we leave government, I've noticed, <laughs> but that's much easier said than done. But I think that's the only practical approach I can think yeah. of. But after all of this that has transpired already, do you think the Iranians will be more likely to want to go beyond the JCPOA or far less likely and well, to just say, you know, you had your chance. Yeah, I suspect their, en their enthusiasm will be under control um, by that point. Very, oh, but, but, beautifully put. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I do, but I do think that there's at least a practical possibility that that kind of approach that, you know, if you resume compliance with the agreement, assuming there's something to resume compliance with, that you'd have a reasonable chance, at least, of beginning a serious negotiation on those other issues. It's certainly the way in which you could 
reanimate an international coalition, which we, mm -hmm. you know, work so hard to build over many years. Right. And okay, so I have a million questions. You have plenty of questions too. We're running out of time, so I think I'm going to keep it to three fairly quick ones, mm -hmm. if I can. Okay. So the, the from from the audience. Uh, the phone call between Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine indicated Trump's unhappiness with the U.S. ambassador at the time, suggesting her attitude towards him was not the best. He also felt she supported his predecessor. Is that typical? Uh, no. Um, and it actually disgusts me, to be honest with you, and I choose that word carefully. Uh, Masha Yovanovitch, who's the ambassador in question, is a former colleague of mine and a superb professional diplomat, serves the administration, whatever administration is elected by the American people. And I think that is a surefire way to undercut your diplomats overseas, to put it mildly. Um, and it just represents a distortion of what diplomacy ought to be about. Diplomacy ought to be about promoting the national interest of the country. When diplomacy becomes a vehicle for using the office of the president, to promote not the national interest, but personal political interest, then you've got real problems. Yeah, well, there are some problems. OK, so um, back in the 1980s, again, on the Middle East peace issue, mm -hmm. um, you detailed how the US insisted on not dealing with Arafat until three criteria were met, which was ultimately successful. So fast forward to today. And we see the goalposts move quite a bit on what are the the preconditions or no preconditions for meeting with Kim Jong-un, what should happen before the, the summit happens, but then that doesn't happen, or are there preconditions or not um, before meeting with the Iranians? What are your thoughts on, at this point, do you just go for it and get the sit down, or do you feel like the US is indeed losing some leverage here? I mean, there are two, I'm, I'm generally, as you'd imagine, again, as a recovering diplomat, a believer in engaging even with your adversaries. I don't think it's a favor to them. I do, however, hesitate sometimes when you, know, you think of starting that process at the highest level, at the summit level. Now, I'm, I'm not, I, I have never been critical of President Trump's decision to meet with Kim Jong-un. Again, it's not like we could point to 30 years of you know, perfect diplomatic progress in dealing with North Korea. The problem, though, is you've got to be realistic. And I think now, after three encounters between the president and Kim Jong-un, it's pretty clear, at least to me, as a non-Korean Peninsula specialist, that there's not a chance in the world Kim Jong-un is going to fully denuclearize anytime soon. So the practical question, I think, is while you preserve full denuclearization as an aspirational goal, which is really important to do, the practical diplomatic question which requires the hard day in, day out work of diplomacy, is are there steps that you can take that reduce the danger in the meantime and put us and our allies in a better position to deter North Korea? And if you set aside the irony of what I'm about to say, you might take a page out of the book we employed with the Iranians, yeah. you know, where we did an interim step that froze their program, walked it back in some important respects, all in return for very limited sanctions relief. We preserved the bulk of that for the later comprehensive talks. And you've seen through your brilliant career, sanctions work <coughs> and not work so well. So what do you think about the utility of, of using them the way they're being used today? Yes to sanctions or no to sanctions the way? Well, I mean, I think where you know, there certainly have been cases where sanctions were a very effective instrument of American diplomacy. It was true with Gaddafi's Libya going back 15 years. Um, it was true with regard to our diplomacy that eventually brought the Iranians you know, to a serious True. position at the mm -hmm. negotiating table. What I worry about today is that we're overusing or abusing that tool, especially when we resort to it purely unilaterally and we're kind of browbeating other mm -hmm. countries to pay attention to this. The danger is not tomorrow, not next year, maybe not even four or five years from now, but even our closest allies are going to decide that they want to distance themselves from their vulnerability to the US financial system. The foreign minister of Germany stood up about a year ago and said, all of us need to reduce our dependence on the US financial system. So we'll wake up eventually and find that this tool, when well used, is an effective instrument, is you know, no longer so easily accessible. Yeah. So what, would you say yes or no? Are the sanctions against North Korea and Iran working or not working? I mean, they're, they're certainly working in the sense that with regard to Iran, we're doing enormous damage to, to the Iranian economy. The problem is when you pursue a policy of maximum pressure, mm 
untethered to realistic political aims, you're asking for collisions of one kind or another. Because what the Iranians are demonstrating is, yes, we can inflict enormous economic damage on them. They can inflict a certain amount of damage, not just on us, but on our partners in the Gulf. Witness the case of the attack on the Iran coal oil facilities recently. So coercive diplomacy can work. The problem with this administration, I think, is that it's a unique form of coercive diplomacy, which is all coercion and no diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a problem. I mean, I think the president himself would love to sit down with President Rouhani, but I think he misreads the Iranians. He thinks this is Kim Jong-un, that they're going to be entranced by a spectacle. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the Iranians are looking for right now, I'm afraid. Well put. And I have to ask you, of all these characters you dealt with over the years, uh, be it Arafat or Gaddafi or Putin, um, who is your favorite in terms of stories to tell at favorite, Washington cocktail yeah. parties? Yeah, favorite's the wrong <laughs> Who's term. Who's the richest, the richest source of lore? Well, I've always felt as both a diplomat and now an author, if you can't get color out of Muammar Gaddafi, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the bloodiest, <laughs> most ruthless dictators around. But I had in an earlier episode of Back Channel Diplomacy dealt a fair amount with him and secret talks that led the you know the Libyans to get out of the business of terrorism and ultimately give up their nuclear program. But I vividly remember two very quick stories, because I know Jerry's about to pull me off the stage. Um, <laughs> but um, one involved, you know, see, so Gaddafi's favorite time to meet was usually 3 o'clock in the morning, which was not my peak time as a diplomat. <laughs> so on this one occasion, we're meeting out in the middle of the Libyan desert in this old army tent. Here's Muammar Gaddafi sitting there, one light bulb coming down from the top of the tent, um, you know, white plastic lawn furniture in the room. It wasn't opulent. And Gaddafi had this really weird habit of pausing in mid-conversation and staring up at the ceiling for like three or four minutes at a time. So like a number of you in this audience, I'm a trained diplomat, you know, trained to carry on conversations. <laughs> so this was a little bit disconcerting. But, but the thing that made this worthwhile in a sense is on this occasion, Gaddafi was wearing a kind of yellow pajama top with photographs of dead African dictators on it. So every time he would pause and stare up at the ceiling, I would try to figure out how many I could guess. And I got pretty good by the end of this. That was last, peak fashion at the time, I think. It, it was. I did not imitate it. But the last thing I'd say, and then I promise I'll get off, is um, it, actually 10 years ago this month at the UN General Assembly, so Gaddafi comes to speak. And you know, leaders are supposed to limit themselves to like 15 minutes or so. Gaddafi spoke for 90 minutes. He did not have a prepared text. It was like scraps of paper that kept falling off the podium and he'd reach down to pick them up. But what I remember most is that 75 minutes into this 90-minute monologue, I was listening to the wonderful UN chief Arabic language interpreter. So he's doing the Arabic to English interpreting, so I have the headphones on. 75 minutes in, you hear him say in Arabic, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> and he throws that's off that's his great. headphones. So if you didn't speak Arabic, you missed the last 15 minutes. But you didn't really miss much. So that's good. Yeah, well, none, yeah. of, none of the commentators said that about, about your talk today. So thanks. I consider that a, a, a diplomatic victory. Thanks, Michelle. So thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. That was fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to have a, a quick uh, um, set change. Uh, I want to, uh, to thank Bill Burns and Michelle Kaczynski for a fascinating discussion. And just a reminder that, uh, that Bill is going to stay back, and uh, we have some copies of his book, Back Channel, uh, available for, uh, for purchase and for his signature. And of course, uh, many anecdotes are in the in the book i think including the uh the story about the tent i think the the tent story is in there as well so so you can have them for uh for your uh, for your amusement and enjoyment um bill's uh bill's book back channel uh offers fascinating insights into the effort to build on the multilateral uh, iran nuclear negotiations to address broader issues of regional stability and security. That background is a great segue into our next panel discussion, uh, 
uh, the challenges of promoting regional stability and the urgency of finding tools for threat reduction in the Middle East are as much a matter of immediate concern today as they were four years ago. Uh, the deterioration of re uh, regional security uh, is not only a consequence of Donald Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA, uh, but also a reflection of ongoing civil and regional conflict in Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Iraq that confronts U.S. policymakers on a daily basis. The threat of nuclear proliferation itself remains a source of concern as not only Iran, but also Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and potentially other regional powers have expressed interest in developing their own nuclear weapons capability. As we prepare to mark the 50th anniversary of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2020, the necessity of addressing this emerging threat is greater than ever. To discuss these issues, we're delighted and honored to have with us this evening former Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz and former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Michelle Flournoy, two of America's most accomplished and experienced uh, statesmen and experts on the issues of Middle East stability and threat reduction. To lead them in a discussion of these issues, uh, the President of the Middle East Institute, our own Paul Salem, will serve as moderator. Um, and uh, please join me in welcoming uh, them to the panel. Uh, before I step off, I do want to, uh, to uh, alert everyone uh, that uh, to use Mintimeter, there is a different, um, there is a different code. So if you want to plug in the new code, please do go ahead and ask questions uh, through that. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, both Secretary Muniz and Under Secretary Flournoy with us uh, today. And Michelle, if I may, let me start with you. And you are now, among many other things, the Vice Chair of CARE, the organization which is uh, hosting or co-hosting this event. Obviously, you've worked a lot in defense uh, policy towards the Middle East and towards the, war, you know, the, the the key issues of the region. From sort of thirty thousand foot view, how do you see the link between national security and the work you're doing now at CARE, human security, human insecurity? What are the connections there? There we go. Um, well, first, thank you so much for hosting us, and thank you all for coming. Um, I think one of the lessons, um, and Bill referred to this, um, that I really took away from government is that it's um, we are rarely successful unless we really um, have an integrated approach that, that looks at national security very broadly defined, not just to think about the military or even just the diplomatic efforts, but also the efforts we're making to affect the actual human conditions on the ground. So many of the conflicts that we see in the Middle East, so many of the challenges um, that we see are really related to underlying conditions that have to do with governments that are unable or unwilling to meet the basic needs of their population. So when I came out of government, I really thought that I wanted to learn more and spend more time looking at the human dimensions of security and trying to find some answers to the question of what actually works. <laughs> um, and I did a lot of looking uh, before I found CARE. And the reason I went with CARE is um, they have a very um, unique approach. First of all, rather than being a typical US NGO getting an AID contract and going in and just doing the work as a US NGO. Their philosophy is to find local partners and empower, build up the local partners, build up the local capacity to actually be addressing these um, issues. The second was the focus on women and girls, and not just because I'm a woman, but because of all the literature that is now showing that when you invest in girls' education, women's ability to save or become entrepreneurs or become um, contributing members of the economy, you not only lift those individuals, you lift whole families, you lift whole communities, and so forth. And then lastly, um, the focus on innovation and scaling. So a lot of what 
care does is it, it, it pioneers or pilots an intervention to show if, you know, and then the ones that have real outsized impact, then it focuses on scaling those. And I'll, I'll give you one example and then I'll, 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 I'll uh, stop. Uh, had a chance to visit CARES work in Bihar, India. It's the poorest state in India. I know it's not the Middle East, but there are programs mm -hmm. like this in the Middle East as well. It deals with maternal and infant health. They did a very particular intervention that had to do with uh, applying an antibiotic when on an umbilical cord when a baby is first born. It had literally dramatic reductions in child mortality in Bihar. Um, they then, so having piloted that, they went and got the Gates Foundation and the government of India to fund scaling that across the entire country, which mm -hmm. has had a huge impact on mortality rate in or infant mortality. So my point is, um, and when you look at the Middle East refugees, what is happening in the refugee camps is so important. And if we care about preventing the next generation of radicalization or the next generation of people who are seeking to use violence to make change, we have got to be paying attention to the fate of the displaced mm. and the refugees in the region. Secretary Jimenez, yes? Comment, uh, in terms of your original question, the linkage of those two uh, threads of Michelle's work. Uh, we have a good example close to the home. It's called Central America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Indeed. And I want to just dip, uh, drill down a bit more before turning to Secretary Muniz. When we look at the human insecurity in the Middle East, a lot of it is obviously long, long term in terms yes. of unemployment, demography, yeah. climate change, uh, things of that nature. But a number of the most acute areas are man-made and recent in the sense of a civil war or yeah. an invasion or a particular activity, I think, of Yemen, of Syria, of Iraq, yes. certainly Libya may be less acutely on the humanitarian side and Afghanistan. When you look at those uh, very political kind of developments that led to the enormous human suffering, how would you make going forward a link between what the U.S. could do at the policy level? Yeah. What are the lower hanging fruit in the Middle East that maybe from a policy perspective would quickly address some of the humanitarian uh, uh, aspect. Yeah. Well, I think one of, one of the lessons is some humility <laughs> in terms of how yeah. we define our objectives and how confident we are that we, through sheer, you know, through military intervention and sheer force of will, can actually remake whole countries or societies or regimes. I mean, it sort of goes to Ambassador Burns' list of all the things that were going to go wrong in Iraq that we could actually have foreseen, but no one was willing to really pay attention to. So a little bit of humility would be a good thing. Um, a much clearer sense of what is our national interest, um, not and and defining things a bit more narrowly. Um, but I think beyond the sort of tendency to want to intervene and fix, and get the short-term change, having a longer-term approach that says, how do we, over a very long period of time, invest with our allies and partners, both in the region and those who are donating and investing in the region, to start to create more sustainable conditions over time and to take a longer term approach to, to development, to education, to building capacity, to building the conditions that will create more viable uh, economies and eventually more viable political systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary Muniz, uh, I wanted to ask obviously about uh, the situation with Iran. Uh, and I wanna start with sort of a general question What's left of the JCPOA? We withdrew from it, but it still exists just between Iran and the other signatories. Uh, what is the risk of it completely unraveling? How wobbly has it gotten? Uh, where is it going in terms of the nuclear conditions that were in the agreement? We pulled out of it, but it's still there. Where are we? Where are we going in the next 12 months at that level? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly certainly pretty wobbly, uh, but um, uh, let me first say, so in terms of what's been happening in terms of Iran's uh, announced violations, step-by-step -step violations of the agreement. I know this is on. Um, um, think this, I think this, I didn't, no I did. Oh, <laughs> is it on? Can, can you hear? Uh, it was changed. Try that one. That should work. Yeah. There you go. Um, the, so in terms of uh, the violations, so, uh, first of all, what Iran, of course, started to do was to um, 
begin to uh, incrementally violate some of the nuclear restrictions. Now, the uh, for, ex uh, for example, uh, an underappreciated element of the JCPOA is the limitation of Iran's enriched uranium stockpile to 300 kilograms with a rather low enrichment level, 3.67 percent. And that is uh, that ha that plays a outsized role in our so-called breakout time of, of, of one year. Well, okay, they began to violate that. But they violated it uh, with relatively modest buildups of the amount and increasing the enrichment to 4.5%. 4.5% is a typical enrichment for, let's say, the Bushir reactor fuel. So, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, it's beginning to nibble at the, at the uh, breakout time, et cetera. But those kinds of steps taken, uh, easily reversible, uh, you know, you could understand the game being played, right? Uh, there's many others in between, but let me say that there, there's another step now being taken which is much more concerning uh, to me, not in terms of a material immediate risk, but until very recently, Iran's violations, as I said, were on the nuclear restraints and not on the verification measures. Big, big difference. Uh, and I've said since 2015, <laughs> when I was among those trying to convince the Congress uh, to produce at least 41 votes uh, in our favor, we got 42, uh, the, uh, that they should understand that the real strength of the agreement is the, ver is the unique verification and transparency regime because that's the basis of the international community's confidence or loss of confidence uh, in Iran uh, uh, going for a covert nuclear program. So when they used some non-authorized materials for centrifuge construction, again, not a big deal in itself, but I would argue you've now starting to nibble on the verification regime. And uh, if that takes serious hits, including uh, statements that mischaracterize their commitments in the agreement to the additional protocol, that's a bad slippery slope into a place where uh, easily misinformation can come up in terms of some activity, loss of access, loss of confidence in the international community, and again, the consequences uh, can easily be projected from there. Well, let me ask, uh, you know, where we are today, uh, you can, one can argue the Iranians would like to find a way out of their sanctions and their suffering economically. They've hinted, Foreign Minister Zarif has hinted at certain things that they might be willing to negotiate about relating to the nuclear, not talking about missiles and interventions in other areas. President Trump apparently would also like some kind of uh, progress in order for there not to be a major escalation during an election year when he was in Japan. He said, he, he talked that his main concern remains nuclear. My question is given, you know, you've negotiated for months with the Iranians, and from your following of the president's statements and so on, what little wiggle room or little opportunities for a deal, even a minor one, uh, between President Trump and maybe President Rouhani, maybe not a you know a grand bargain, but something that would avoid a major escalation? Are there any easy wins, any low-hanging fruit remaining? I know you've tried everything at the time. Or are we set? You, you, a, you, you yeah. seem to have a fixation on, on, on fruit. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, hungry. Your, your so, questions, you know. but uh, the... Uh, um, thinking in biblical terms uh, also. It's, uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I wouldn't argue that uh, President Trump uh, wants to avoid another military, uh, significant military confrontation uh, in the Middle East in an election year. But frankly, I take his statement at face value that it's not only in an election year that uh, he really, I think, uh, wants to avoid um, uh, military 
potentially a conflagration in, in, the, in the Middle East. However, having said that, I go back to what Bill Burns said, uh, that uh, another case of coercion without diplomacy, uh, no obvious way out of the box uh, that has been uh, has been created, and here I think, Bill, the box is defined, uh, and we're in it, uh, and can't figure a way a way out. Uh, I think, for one thing, uh, I think we should remember that even during the negotiation, which led to obviously the Supreme Leader's uh, concurrence in signing the agreement in July of 2015. He was also consistently saying, you can't trust the Americans. Terrific. So for one thing, in terms of finding a way out, first of all, I think it has to be something. It has to be JCPOA plus. I don't see how uh, one just magically gets, you know, status quo ante is not going to uh, result. And by the way, in going back to the conversation with Bill, that... Uh, I have to say, I think that that is also, I would make the same statement about the next administration, even if it is a different one. Uh, it's just very difficult politically now to simply go back uh, status quo ante, even if it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and frankly, there is not really any status quo ante anyway, because if nothing else, you've lost a lot of clock time on the restrictions we had on uh, Iranian activity, uh, a time that would have been much better used in trying to build cooperation in addressing our other regional uh, regional problems. But with that statement about trust, uh, I cannot see, I think we have limited the options because I cannot see Iran doing, agreeing to anything irreversible. We're not going to see more cement poured into a reactor. Uh, uh, because uh, I think it's going to take a long time, no matter who the president is, uh, to rebuild enough trust to have something like, like that happen. By the way, in, in, this is a, an association, but uh, uh, combining a little bit of what I said earlier about the Iranian activities, I would argue that the actions, which they deny, but... Uh, we can all discuss the credibility of that denial uh, in terms of the attack on the Saudi oil uh, processing facilities. That's what I call an example of an irreversible action. Sure, you can always rebuild everything from scratch, but that's another case where I think uh, the verification nibbling, the Iraq action, uh, the, uh, uh, Saudi, the Saudi action, those are just going to be very, very hard to unwind. Thank you, and maybe I want to, you know, use that to ask you, Michel, uh, to put on your DOD hat. We're in the middle of a major escalation in the Middle East. It, in the Iranian attack on the Abqaiq and other facilities uh, in Saudi Arabia, but they were triggered by U.S. sanctions on Iran, so it's a complicated sort of three-way. Uh, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the U.S. mobilized an entire military force, in a sense, to protect Saudi oil facilities and so on. It's been a sort of a pillar of U.S. policy in the Middle East about the free flow of energy mm -hmm. and an assumption that, you know, Gulf oil is a national security interest. And yet, when this much bigger attack on Saudi than, than the invasion of Kuwait, a direct attack on Saudi oil production, half of their production went offline, uh, we did not see a, a, you know, such a direct U.S. Uh, reaction. My question is, one, do you see a sea change, at least in this administration's valuation of Gulf energy, administration's security umbrella for Gulf shipping and for Saudi Arabia? Is that a permanent or profound change? And secondly, we're in the middle of what seems to be an escalation. Uh, do you see that it could get even worse than the attacks we saw recently. Uh, what, what, you know, what, what area are we in uh, when you look at it with your defense hat? Right. So um, I am not an energy economist, but I do think that there are a number of folks in this administration and, and outside it 
who believe that you know the United States as a country is in a different energy position with less dependence ourselves on oil and petroleum products coming from the Middle East. That said, I think everybody under well, we hope everybody understands that it's still an internationally priced commodity, and so perturbations in the in the in the supply can affect oil prices that impact um, the U.S. you know companies and consumers, even if we're not dependent on the oil ourselves. Um, so uh, that is, I think, there's still sensitivity there. But my my interpretation of the caution is uh, there's several things contributing. One is I actually do think that this president is not eager to get into another Middle East war. Thank God, um, whether it's elections related or just he's you know reads the American people and their war weariness and he doesn't have the appetite himself. Um, I think his also his military advisors have been very explicit with him about some of the risks and costs of the options that have been presented. Number two is I think he's heard a fairly significant message of restraint from the Saudi the Saudis. Um, they have gone sort of roll, slow rolled saying, wait a minute, let's get the facts. We want to be sure of the attribution. Let's not rush into this because I think they worry that you know the administration might take one very strong action and then they would you know experience an even Deep greater price, yeah. retaliation and and we wouldn't be prepared for that so this is one of those questions where you have to think through the second and third and fourth and fifth moves before you evaluate the advisability of the first um, the last thing is i think the president has just put himself in a really difficult kind of damned if you do damned if you don't mm -hmm. situation um, where he's had a lot of talk, tough talk and lo made a lot of threats. Um, but if he acts, there's a huge risk of, mis of, of miscalculation and further escalation, not only potentially against Saudi Arabia, but against the forces we still have in Iraq, which are very vulnerable to Iranian-backed proxies should they dis decide to start targeting Americans. Um, but he's also up against the wall that if the U.S. does nothing after all of this tough talk, it hurts our credibility. Mm -hmm. So I think they are truly sort of at a loss. I think the um, Pentagon and others have been trying to offer them very limited, proportionate, sort of almost symbolic actions that could be taken, but with very low risk of escalation. Um, but none of that deci those decisions have not been mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. Okay, please do. Um, First of all, I, th I want to reinforce, uh, now, now I'm speaking as an energy person, mm -hmm. uh, reinforce a very important point uh, that uh, Michelle just made, uh, but briefly. You made it brief, very briefly. I want to punctuate it. Uh, and that is that uh, all the talk about uh, our being uh, uh, energy independent or nearly energy independent is nonsense. Uh, and uh, the exposure to the global oil price uh, is a very, very simple way of saying it. Indeed, as a little anecdote, if you go back 20 years, when you may remember all of these striking truckers in the, in the UK, the UK was a net oil exporter at that time. It didn't shield them from the great price spike uh, in diesel fuel, which is what had the truckers uh, going. So, you know, this is not a very complicated issue. Uh, we should recognize it. Secondly, the oil and to a certain extent ga and gas infrastructure is a very distributed infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It is extremely difficult to defend, uh, particularly in the modern world, including, as we saw, cruise missiles and drones and everything else. And I think that has come home uh, very much uh, to hit the Saudis thinking, et cetera. And third, I think the Saudis have come to realize and have, and this has generated a lot of, I think, newfound caution. They came to realize how exposed they are to having all of their 2030 dreams just go into a pot and get thrown out the window. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, a nice fat listing of uh, Saudi Aramco on the Saudi stock exchange would have been a very ugly sight if, uh, if that had already happened. So I think uh, everybody is getting to see uh, 
for their own reasons why we got to find a way to turn down the, the heat and nobody knows how to do it. Uh, and, uh, and the risk of something, uh, miscalculation, uh, setting off the, the tinder uh, is, is really high. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me ask you, Secretary Moniz, about uh, and integrate some of the questions from the audience. Uh, if you could walk us through a little bit the civilian nuclear programs that have evolved in the Middle East, some of them the U.S. You know, has agreements with some countries, the Russians have deals with others. How do you see the civilian nuclear you know, industry developing in the Middle East? What might be a matter of concern for you and what is not a concern? And the second part to that question is, if one works towards a region free of nuclear weapons at least, we've been talking about Iran, of course, Israel has nuclear weapons, and I'm sure you've been involved in some of the... Allegedly. Alleg allegedly. Uh, uh, the multilateral efforts to try to come to an agreement of the Middle East without weapons, or at least nuclear weapons, or WMD, uh, do you see any potential there? So first on the civilian side, and then on a regional approach. Well, first of all, uh, it's clear that... Uh, Building nuclear reactors, uh, uh, and certainly in the Middle East, uh, by having other vendors like Russia, uh, uh, China increasingly uh, competing, the um, uh, United States unable to compete for because of lack of uh, peaceful uses agreement uh, with uh, most con most of the countries. Uh, nuclear. We should understand the nuclear power plants do not themselves pose a risk. The issue is the fuel cycle facilities before or after the power plant. So enrichment uh, is one major risk. Reprocessing to extract plutonium on the back end is the other major risk. Uh, obviously in Iran, we're dealing with both. Uh, now, and we will have more and more rationale for doing nuclear power as the climate challenge becomes more and more front and center. In fact, uh, as this is an aside, but we can go into my climate hat as well, uh, that uh, just since Paris, not even four years ago, the science context has changed completely. Whereas something like an 80% reduction target, which was the Paris Agreement by mid-century, is now increasingly going to what's called net zero. When you start pushing that, uh, something like nuclear becomes more and more important potentially as a, as a solution. Uh, uh, and obviously our concern in the proliferation world is that that becomes a cover for, uh, for uh, other, other ambitions. So what can we do? We have two examples of what we can do in terms of policy arrangements. And they're both in the Middle East. One is called the Emirates and the so-called gold standard, where they say we will not build any enrichment or reprocessing facilities. And that's pretty you know, reasonable to be able to check uh, in various ways. Uh, we could even strengthen it further with, with their IAEA relationships. The other one is called Iran. It's there, they have enrichment and reprocessing, or will have uh, rep reprocessing. They do have enrichment uh, at some level, but they do also have a unique uh, verification system, as I said earlier, uh, that gives tremendous power to the IAEA. Uh, and while uh, I would, uh, by the way, in the introduction, I, I was surprised by, by elevation from physicist to statesman, but anyway, that's uh, the, or a demotion, or I'm not sure which. Uh, uh, the, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, we, I've lost my thread now, what did I, when I made that joke? Uh, the UAE and, the, and Iran, no, sorry, but Iran, uh, uh, because the IAE has these exceptional uh, uh, powers, uh, frankly, Oh, yes, and the intelligence, and I would never say guaranteed uh, 
uh, the IAEA or U.S. or allied intelligence services have a 100 percent guaranteed uh, probability of finding any covert program. But I will say, and Jim Clapper said this in 2015, that there's a lot of confidence that the Iran verification agreement lifts the bar on deception so high that you would be taking an enormous risk especially with the assumption that getting caught doing that again would bring the coherent wrath of the international community uh, back, back down on them. So, you know, everybody talks gold standard. We could also talk uh, Iran-like verification regimes uh, in the Mideast and elsewhere uh, as, as a way to go. Uh, now, in the negotiations, it was very clear and I'm not saying anything I think out of school here. Uh, maybe I am, but okay, I'll say it anyway. Uh, you know, and, and in the IAEA Board of Governors discussions, it's well known that Russia in particular pushes back very hard on any idea that the Iranian steps should be thought of as steps to be broadly applicable uh, in, the, in, the, in the safeguards world. Well, I don't agree with them. This is what we should be doing to advancing the safeguards re re regime uh, uh, broadly. I love the gold standard, don't get me wrong, but I'll take the verification regime as well as, as, a, as an important way to go. Thank you, Mr. Muniz. Uh, Ms. Flournoy, two questions from the audience, so uh, i give both of them to you. Uh, the Trump administration has suspended aid to the West Bank and Gaza and uh, so a question from your organization's point of view, how do you see the impact of that? What are you doing in that space? Uh, and a second question from an audience member uh, relates to violent extremism. And from your work on you know, humanitarian aid, refugees, whether it's working with women or other approaches, how much do you find that that is effective in preventing or de-radicalizing or preventing the radicalization uh, in the first place, so both of yeah. those questions. So I think what's what's happened in the Palestinian areas is has been uh, close to catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the situation on the ground has become much more dire for innocent civilians that have nothing to do with Hamas, nothing to do with uh, the government. Um, and I, it's exactly the opposite of what I think U.S. policy should be. I think the best way that we can work towards um, a stable solution to this problem ultimately is even at the times when negotiations are not happening or they're not productive or it's hard to see a way forward, that we keep at the work of building the capacity. We want to build the capacity of the Palestinians to ultimately ha have a self-sufficient state, um, just as we continue to invest in the capacities of, of our friends in Israel. So, but so the notion that you you know you re reduce or cut um, aid as opposed to use it to build their own police institutions, their educational institutions, their economy, and so forth is just to me it's completely backwards and not in support of our interests. It's very, mm -hmm. very short-sighted. Um, and it's not going to get anybody to the negotiating.
radicalization, the thing that I'm worried about, worried about right now is the um, thousands of ISIS fighters and the tens of thousands of family members that are in these camps um, along the Syrian border with no sort of end game. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, we got a <laughs> chaos. But I would argue that in the chaos and all the fluctuations, if you look at kind of the underlying, maybe slow trend, see, I think there's some progress. And the question is, how, do, how are we going to bring that out? Progress in um, moving away from... husband. She had no role in the family's kind of um, sustainment, etc., other than, you know, being in, in at home and cooking and cleaning and taking care of kids. She, uh, a care program came in, uh, offered to teach subsistence farmers how to get greater yields from their crops. Um, she begged her husband to let her be part of this. And